Our lesson this morning is entitled, Maintaining Our Unique Identity. And this is a lesson that I've wanted to preach for a while, and this seemed to be as good a time as any. But what we're talking about here is Matthew 16, 18, Jesus Christ said, Upon this rock I will build my church. And so you and I as believers in God's word have to focus on what the church is. Because all around us, and I think by the influence of Satan, unwittingly on the parts of individuals who are good people. To me, one of the saddest things is, here's a person who says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that He died for my sins. I try to live a good moral life according to the moral standard of the Bible. I try to put Jesus first in my life. And I sacrifice financially to make that possible. And I teach my family and I try to be a good husband or a good wife or a good son or daughter. And in all of these things, they're trying their very best to be what God would have them to be. And yet, they're not a part of the Lord's church. Now, they think they are. That's what grieves my soul to no end. Because these are good, honest people who want to do right, and yet they've been misled. The general thought I think the denominational world has is that, well, all these different denominations are part of the one true church. Is that what the Bible teaches? Did you get that idea from the Scriptures? Because other people have said very derogatory things like, well, you people in the Church of Christ think you're the only ones going to heaven. And so they picture us as a small denomination in the vast majority of denominations and how outrageous and audacious for us to say that we're the only ones that are right. But what we need to keep in mind instead of letting these kind of influences cause us to change our thinking and to lose our convictions is to go back and say, now wait a minute, who defines the church? What is the church? How do we know that? And am I a part of the Lord's church or not? Because if we begin to give in and because of our sympathy for one another and our love for mankind generally or even some of our family members who are not serving the Lord in His church, uh, we kind of want to give up the fight and say, let's just all be one together and be united. Because after all, don't we all believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And my question is, is that what the Bible teaches and so as we go along, that's the point of this lesson today. Because if you have a church with a human name, is that the same as the New Testament? If you have a church that has added human creeds like so many of them have, is that still the New Testament church? If you have human practices like instrumental music, for example, or counting beads or burning candles as part of your worship, is is that still the Lord's church? And if you have human organizations that have national networks or even universal networks like the Catholic Church does, is that the same thing as what we read about in the Bible? It's a very simple question to ask. And the question that should come to us as honest people is, if these things are bad, then how can we determine a New Testament church? How do you know which church is the church of Christ? There's 300 mainline denominations out there, and if you count the really vague ones and the obscure ones, there's 1,500. How can you come down to one? Or do we need to come down to one? Maybe we're wrong, and, and there's a lot of different rooms for uh, error to be accepted. That's what our denominational friends would say. But the answer is very simple. Build according to the blueprint. Amen. Where does that come from? We're not trying to be hateful or ugly. I'm just saying, let's take honest, sincere people and point this out and say, now if you think being a part of a man-made denomination is the same thing as being a part of Christ's church, then I want you to explain to me how you come to that conclusion. And as we present this lesson, you'll see my point. Now notice in Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, that's a good place to begin because it says in that passage, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. This is John speaking. And the angel stood and said, Rise and measure what? The temple of God, 
the altar and those who worship there. Let that sink in. Revelation 11, 1 is saying we're going to find out what this church is all about. The temple of God is the church. The altar are the acts of worship. And those who worship there are the worshipers. Why measure them at all if one's as good as another? And the answer is because they're not. And what is the measuring rod of this passage? And we all know it would have to be none other than the Word of God itself. So the angel in this vision is telling John, you take God's Word and you measure the temple and the altar and those who worship in it. And in doing that, we see the temple of God, for example, is the church. Well, we know it was built by Jesus because he said so in Matthew 16, 18. So there's the origin. That's where it began. And if I were a member of a human denomination, I would ask myself, did this church begin back when Jesus died on the cross? And if the answer is no, then it's not the same, is it? And the foundation. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 where the Apostle Paul is arguing for the church. And he says, according to the grace of God which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Paul, how did you lay the foundation? As an apostle, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and to build the church which he built in the book of Acts throughout the Roman Empire. And he said, if any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write are the commandments of the Lord. And so he didn't build one church one way and another church another way and a third one a third way. He built them all the same. And he laid the foundation and the foundation is Jesus Christ himself. We see that also look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. But now wait a minute, I thought you said that the foundation was Jesus Christ, but Ephesians 2.20 says it's the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And those are identical statements emphasizing two different things. Paul, as one of those apostles, said, I have laid the foundation, but he said the foundation is Jesus Christ. So that when we read in Ephesians 2, the foundation of the apostles and prophets is not the foundation of them, but the foundation which they laid. So when the apostles and prophets revealed God's word, they revealed the blueprint for what the Lord's church should be about. And that's why we have the Holy Spirit inspired apostles that we read about in John 14, 15, and 16. And so, so far, so good. The name should be Church of Christ. Now we do read in Hebrews chapter 12 of all of the church, universal. The apostle who wrote of Hebrews chapter 12 says, You've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the church of the firstborn. And the church of the firstborn, firstborn in the Greek is plural, so it should be the church of the firstborn ones. All those who have been born again have been added to the Lord's church. That's universal. But when you talk about a local congregation, Paul said in Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Now our denominational friends say, well, we're a church of Christ. We just have this human name added to it or that human name added to it or another human name added to it. But when you add a human name to it, it's not the same thing any longer. And someone said, well, how do you know that church of Christ is proper? Because it says churches of Christ. Well, if you have a cow and then you have another cow, what do you have? You have two cows. Thank you. <laughs> cows. So if you have churches of Christ, you have a plurality of the church of Christ, right? And that's simple enough. And so Romans 16, 16 is not arguing for multiple denominations, but a, numer uh, a number of the same thing, the same church, the church of Jesus Christ. So question number one is, here's the temple of God being measured. And if it doesn't have its origin back on the day of Pentecost, if it doesn't have Jesus as the foundation, how can you have Jesus as the foundation? 
And that is the Word of Jesus Christ, book, chapter, and verse, Matthew to Revelation is the foundation that Jesus Christ laid. 2 John 9, whoever transgresses does not abide in what? The doctrine of Christ does not have God. The doctrine of Christ is the foundation. And if you don't have that, you say, well, we have that, but we also have our creed book. Well, now you're out. You just violated the, the blueprint. Well, we have the name Church of Christ, but we added something to it. Well, now you've violated the blueprint. Well, we have most of the things that we do by authority. Well, then you've violated the blueprint. Now, I've even had members of the Church of Christ say, well, we do lots of things for which we have no authority. Well, if you name one, I'll quit it. Amen. But what they mean is air conditioner and lights and things of that sort, the pews. They don't understand that that all comes under the general umbrella of assembling together, Hebrews 10.25. So, so far we're okay, but you can see this eliminates 99% of those churches which may be filled with a lot of good and honest people who think they're loving the Lord, obeying Him, and serving Him, and yet they have blinders on when it comes to the New Testament church or the church of Jesus Christ. And that grieves my soul. The terms of admission. Without faith it's impossible to please him. 11, Hebrews 11, 6. God commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17, 30. With the heart man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto what? Salvation. Salvation Romans 10, 10. And Galatians 3, 27. As many of you have been baptized into Christ and put on Christ. So there's faith, repentance, confession, baptism. If your church doesn't teach all of those, then that's not the church of Christ, is it? And most of them teach salvation by faith only. One of their creed books says, by grace alone, by faith alone. Another one says that we're saved by grace through faith is very comforting and very full of, is wholesome and very full of comfort. But that's a human creed book. If they don't have these steps, then they're not Christians, no matter how sincere they think they are. And somebody says, well, that just doesn't seem fair. Well, it has to be fair because remember Jesus said in John 14 in our Bible class lesson, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Muslims say that's not really fair. Think of the millions of Muslims who don't believe in Jesus. The Hindus, millions who don't believe in Jesus. They're sincere, honest people. A lot of them are equally as good as you and me morally. Maybe better in some cases. But that's not the question. The question is, are we a member of the church of Jesus Christ, the one we read about in the New Testament? So as we go on searching the Scriptures, well, we not only want to measure the, the uh, temple, but now the altar, the acts of worship. There are five acts of worship specified in the New Testament that the church is to practice. It began in Acts chapter 2 when it says they continued steadfastly in what? The apostles' doctrine. You mean it makes a difference what you believe? Do you know that our denominational friends, in order to have fellowship with one another, have this position? They say, as long as we believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God then we can differ on doctrinal matters. And doctrinal matters include the organization of the church, the name of the church, um, acts of worship. They put all these things in this box called the doctrinal matters as though doctrine doesn't matter. But they've made that distinction up on their own. Second John 9 still says, Whoever transgresses not abide in the what? The doctrine of Christ does not have God. Well, does that include all these things? It includes everything from Matthew to Revelation. You can't say, well, let's just pull out one, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and everything else fits in the box. But that's what they have to do in order to have fellowship with each other. If you wonder, that's how they do it. But in the first church in the New Testament, Acts chapter 2, they continued steadfastly. That means unwaveringly, diligently, Specifically, in the Apostles' Doctrine, what is that? It's what we call the New Testament today. But it was the doctrine that Jesus Christ gave them by the Holy Spirit when He gave the Holy Spirit to them to teach everything perfectly. 
It's the doctrine that Paul said in 2 Timothy 3 is all scriptures inspired of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished in all good works. Does doctrine matter? If it doesn't, why did the first church continue so steadfastly in it? And when you open your mind just a little bit and you start reading the New Testament epistles, over and over again, most of those epistles deal with two things. Immorality by brethren when they haven't learned how to live better and false doctrine that's creeping into the church. You think about it. Acts chapter 20, Paul's telling the church at Ephesus, After my departure, grievous wolves shall come in among you, not sparing the flock. They will speak perverse things, draw away disciples after them. These are Christians who have followed Jesus honestly and sincerely have obeyed the gospel and up to this point has done everything they're supposed to do. But a false teacher, a grievous wolf comes in and makes havoc of the church and draws them off to follow them. There's your first denomination. And how sad that is. Because they're honest, but they've been deceived. They're honest, but they've been misled. They're honest, but they've been blinded to the truth, and now they no longer believe the truth. And that's where we have to stop and say, let me examine myself to be sure I'm in the faith. Let's examine this church to be sure we're doing everything we're supposed to be doing. Because it does matter what the church teaches. This is the foundation of the church. Other foundation can no one lay them out which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ, the foundation is Jesus Christ, His Word. You can't separate those two. And that's another thing our denominational friends do. They want to separate Jesus the person from Jesus' doctrine. And that's how they try to maintain unity even though they disagree. John 12, 48 says you can't do that. Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my word has one who judges him. They're combined. They go hand in hand. If you believe in Jesus and love Jesus, he said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll what, Clyde? Keep my commandments. Which ones? All of them. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he left the great commission of the apostles. And after converting those people by baptism, he said in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you always, even in the world. And so the religious world is actually a concoction of Satan to try to destroy the Lord's church by hiding it and by getting good and honest people to believe that that human denomination is the same thing as the church and the Bible. And how sad that is. The altar of worship includes prayer. In Jesus' name, First Timothy 2 and verse 8, Paul said, I would that holy men everywhere Pray lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Prayer is an integral part of the Lord's church and should be something practiced. Music, Ephesians 5, 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Didn't you enjoy doing that this morning? Well, I missed the song service. I was sitting there thinking, why don't we come back about 4.30 and do it again? I could sing for 30 minutes, then we can have worship. If we do, I might preach four hours. You never know. <laughs> but music is vocal from the heart. And people say, you folks in the church of Christ don't believe in music. Yes, we do. Acapella music is music. But you see, Ephesians 5, 19 and every other New Testament passage on the subject of music includes vocal music, never instrumental. One exception, the harps in Revelation, which are figurative, and not literal, it's in heaven, not on earth. Doesn't count. Doesn't work that way. And then the Lord's Supper in memory of Jesus, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 25. Paul said, I have delivered you that which I received from the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, took bread and said, Take, eat this of my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner he took the cup also. After giving thanks and said, Drink this all of you in memory of me. How many churches don't do that? Oh, we do it once a year <clears throat> or once a quarter. But Acts 20 and 7 says on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. So again, if I'm a member of a church that doesn't do this every first day of the week, am I as good as the one that does? This is the blueprint, is the blueprint to be smeared 
or diluted or watered down? And if so, what's your Bible verse to prove that you have the authority to do that? Because Paul said, even if an angel from heaven preaches any other gospel to you than that which I preached unto you, let him be what? Accursed, anathema, condemned. And so that's what the Bible's teaching. Giving on the first day of the week a free will offering of the members. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 is I've given order to the church of Galatia. So you must do also. That's pretty plain, isn't it? Here's the five acts of worship that are to be observed every first day of the week. And if the church that a person's a member of doesn't do that, is that just as good? Because that's the argument. Well, you people do that and that's fine, but we don't have to. In other words, you're following a blueprint, but we're not, but we're both okay. That's what they're taught. Because it has been ingrained in their minds that the details don't matter. That's legalism. That's technicalities. But that's false doctrine trying to deceive people. Because again, the Lord told John, take the measuring rod and you measure the temple. And you measure the altar, the acts of worship. And you measure those who worship there. So then we have the worshipers. Who are they? They're the saints, the children of God, mentioned repeatedly in the New Testament epistles. For example, Ephesians 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. You know, there's an article in today's bulletin from Bill Cruz on what is a saint? And you know that our Catholic friends think saints are people who have died and they've been dead so long we've forgotten their bad things and they've done so much good we're going to make them a saint. Is that how the word's used in the New Testament? Is that thought as good as what Paul said in Ephesians 1? Because he's writing to living people and he calls them saints in Ephesus. You and I are saints in Kansas City. Living, breathing, children of God who've been born again and washed in from our sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. We make up the church and we are the worshipers in the temple. We're called children of God. Galatians 3, you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have what? Put on Christ. Is an honest, sincere person who thinks he's following Christ but never has put Christ on in baptism a child of God? If so, how did you come to that conclusion? Because if they don't have to be baptized for the remission of sins to become a child of God, why did we? Oh, you folks, you know, you, you Bible thumpers. You know, anything to ignore the obvious which is we don't have an answer for the argument, so we'll ignore the argument. Or we'll attack the speaker. Or we'll attack the church and say they're bad people. They're narrow-minded. But keep in mind, Jesus was very narrow-minded and thought of as such by everybody who listened to him. That thing alone caused a majority of people to turn back and follow him no more. And so we have to follow Jesus Christ in doing this. Again, we see that the name are Christians. Acts eleven twenty six. they were called Christians first at Antioch. Very simple. What is a Christian? He's a follower of Christ who wears the name of Christ because he is the bride, part of the bride of Christ. Makes perfect sense. But then sometimes people come up and say, are you a church of Christer? You ever heard that term? If you have, raise your hand. We've got somebody here. To, oh, a lot of you have. You know why they say, are you a church of Christer? Because what's their other option? Are you a Christian? Oh, well, I'm a Christian. I thought you said you were a Baptist or a Catholic or a Lutheran. Oh, I am, but I'm that kind of Christian. Well, that's not what Acts 11.26 says. Peter said in 1 Peter 4.11, if anyone speak, let him speak how? As the oracles of God. And I like teasing. And I grew up in the South and 90% of my friends were Baptists. And I love them all. Good people. A lot of them more moral than some of in the church. But I always tease them. I say, you know, you can't find a Baptist in the whole Bible. And boy, they'd run to John the Baptist. I said, no, you lost. What do you mean? He's not John a Baptist. He's John the Baptist. And if he's John the Baptist, that means he's the only one. 
And he pointed everybody to Jesus and said, follow him. If you follow Jesus, you'll be a what? A Christian. Now again, people think that's mean-spirited. It's what the Bible says. How is it being mean-spirited? Well, because you're saying they're all wrong. I didn't say any such thing. I'm saying let's follow the blueprint. And what does the blueprint show? We're doing what God told John to do. Take the reed of God's word, a measuring rod, and measure the temple, and measure the altar, and measure the worshipers. What do you find? And then the character of these people. Well, they're holy priesthood, and they're obedient to the call of Jesus Christ. That's what makes us unique or distinct from all others who claim the same thing. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, You all as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now think about that a minute. Where have you heard these terms before? A spiritual house, a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices. If you remember, that's the same terminology that God used in reference to ancient Israel in the Old Testament. And do you think that you could worship God any way you wanted to in the Old Testament? You remember Nadab and Abihu, they offered a fire which God had not commanded, but it was still fire. One fire is just as good as another. Well, if it was, how come they died in a conflagration of God and His wrath against them? So when we see in the New Testament these same terms being applied to the spiritual temple, the spiritual Israel then we should know God wants to be worshipped according to His command in His way and in the way that He has ordained. Follow the blueprint. And so many in the Church of Christ today have lost their faith about these things and they're becoming a denomination just like all the rest of the world. And in doing so, I don't see how they can be saved and be right with the Lord because they're not following the blueprint anymore. Well, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, before we go on. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3 says to the brethren, This is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are what? Not burdensome. Oh, you folks don't love the God. We love God. Well, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So when we keep His commandments, are we loving God more than you who don't? I would think so. Because that's the definition of the Bible. And of course our attitude is to worship God in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. The Father seeks such to worship Him. What spirit? The spirit of love and kindness and obedience to God? Doing His acts of worship the way that He has prescribed in the place where He has prescribed for them to be done? And in truth that's the Word of God? So now we've measured the temple, the acts of worship, the altar, and the worshipers. But think of all the threats that the devil is throwing at the church, trying to dilute it, trying to destroy it, trying to pervert it, trying to change it. Because if you notice in Revelation chapter 12, in this great vision that God gave John, in Revelation 12 and verse 1, it says, A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And that's simply a symbol saying that Israel, through Mary, gave birth to Jesus Christ. And then it says in verse 3, in verse 2, Then being with child, she cried out in labor to give birth. And pain to give birth. The church was born. Acts chapter 2. The day of Pentecost. Look at all the pain and suffering that Jesus went through to build his church. For that spiritual child to be born. But here's where I'm pointing. Verse 3. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold a great red fiery dragon. With seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Now we know who that represents don't we? That's Satan. Satan. Great, fiery, red dragon. Can't miss that if you try. But he has seven heads, which means he's extremely intelligent. And he has ten horns, which means he's very vicious and malicious. And he has seven diadems in his head. 
because he wants everyone to worship him rather than Jesus Christ. Don't you remember one of the temptations of Satan himself when he came to Jesus in the wilderness? Fall down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Fall down and worship who? Me. That's what he's talking about here. Verse 4, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Satan was trying to destroy the church. She bore him male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled in the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Symbolically saying that the battle between Satan and the church, the bride of Christ, is going to be very severe. Verse 7, war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Neither was there any place for them found in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, the devil and Satan, who deceives what? The whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony that they did not love their lives. They did not love their lives to the death. But here's the lesson that applies to this. Verse 12, Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. What do you think Satan's trying to do while he's down here on the earth? He's still trying to destroy the Lord's church. And he does so by false doctrine, by lies, by deception. He's very cunning, he's very crafty. Paul said, we're not ignorant of his devices. Well, I know a whole lot of people who are very ignorant of his devices, but we shouldn't be. And so here's the kind of things that Satan has thrown at the church to try to obscure it and destroy it. You have modernism, which has cropped up in the church. Very common among denominationalists. Over 40 years ago, I asked a preacher friend of mine who was a ordained minister of the Methodist Church. And I said, I just read in a magazine that the Methodist preachers coming out of your seminaries no longer believe in the, in the virgin birth of Jesus. The number, I think, was somewhere around 40 or 50 percent. He said, well, I don't know what the exact number is, but he said, that sounds about right. You want a preacher in your pulpit who says, the virgin birth is impossible because that's a miracle and miracles don't happen. That's modernism. In other words, science explains everything, and if science can't explain it, then it can't be true. Well, if you start applying that principle of modernism to the Bible, well, the Red Sea didn't split because that can't happen. Jesus wasn't raised from the dead because nobody's done that before. And you start eliminating everything that's miraculous in the Bible, pretty soon you have nothing left. That's modernism. That's exactly what many of our denominations today believe. And the devil has enlisted governments to promote things of an atheistic, modernistic nature. For example, evolution. And many of the religious fundamentalists who deny not only the virgin birth, but the inspiration of the Bible. Oh, it's old-fashioned to say that every word of the Bible is inspired, and they try to find a particular so-called error to prove their point. That's the devil trying to attack the church. Sectarianism. In other words, loyalty to a man or to a group or to a family church or organization. The term sect is sectarian. The very name denomination suggests a part of a whole. And our friends want to say, well, all these denominations are part of the one true church. Well, they're all different. They're not following the pattern. Calvinism, salvation by faith only, once saved, always saved. Things like that are an example of the five points of tulip. Man's born totally depraved. Therefore, he has to be unconditionally elected. Therefore, Christ limited his atonement for only the elect. 
And on that goes. That's a whole system of doctrine that is as false to the core as it can be. And yet most of our denominational friends believe a form of that. Satan has done a good job. Our Pentecostal friends say, well, you folks don't have the Spirit. We've got the Spirit. And so theirs is a very emotional, subjective religion that's based on how I feel. And they sing and they all pray together lifting up hands. And they have all these emotional things. And they say, isn't that great? And they go home feeling so good because they think that's how you worship Jesus. Losing sight of our own distinctive plea. Again, many churches of Christ today are saying, well... This thing we've always practiced, that's just Church of Christ doctrine. As though we're just one denomination in the great group of denominations. Well, Church of Christ doctrine is what the New Testament teaches. And if the New Testament doesn't teach it, we don't believe it. And so Church of Christ doesn't have its own creed book. We don't have a system of beliefs that we can enumerate and say... This is all that we believe and nothing more, nothing less. If somebody wants to see your creed book, hand them the New Testament. Say, there it is. That's our creed book. But we've lost our distinctive plea because we want to get along with everybody. We want to be friends with the people that we love. And so it's very easy for us to say, well, you know, let's, let's not be real distinctive in our plea anymore. Let's not call Bible things by Bible names and do Bible things in Bible ways. And many Church of Christ have lost that distinction. And it's kind of funny how they get blinded to that. I've told you the story before. But when I lived in Searcy, Arkansas, I preached at a gospel meeting in the next town, Bald Knob. And I was talking about some of the Church of Christ in Searcy that had added to the Lord's Church. And I said, do you know that the College Church of Christ, they have 6,000 members, have women preachers? Unbeknownst to me, one of the members of that church was in the audience and so I stood at the back to shake hands and she was so mad she came out she said I'll have you know that we do not have women preachers in the college church of Christ and you just lied about us I said really I said would you do me a favor will you look on the front page of your bulletin next Sunday and tell me in the top right corner it has the name of two young people one's a man and one's a woman and if I believe right they call them youth ministers and when I said that her face turned white as a sheet you see we get used to false ideas and don't realize what they are and so she got shook and she just started shaking she said well I'm going to go talk to them about that so I get their bulletin that's how I knew this the next week I got their weekly bulletin guess what top right corner there's no names they didn't get rid of the youth ministers but they took them off the bulletin is that honest of course not. But you see, that's what Church of Christ are doing all over the country. They're losing their distinct, distinctive nature, and they're teaching a different doctrine. Some of them are teaching forms of Calvinism. Some of them are teaching forms of Pentecostalism. Some of them are adding women preachers to the number. Some of them are adding instrumental music to the, to the church. And then the tendencies of inherited membership. That's the Christian who says, well, we've always done it that way. Why do you do what you do? Well, that's the church I grew up in. That's how we are. In other words, you're doing it because mom and dad did it. Well, why are mom and dad doing it? Well, their parents did it. Why are they doing it? Well, hopefully their parents did it. But that's not why I'm a Christian. That's not why I'm a member of the Church of Christ. I didn't inherit my membership. I can't ride to heaven on the coattails of mom and dad. So I have to know all the things we're talking about today and be able to give book, chapter, and verse because if I don't do that, then I don't know if I'm following the blueprint or not. If I'm following an inherited religion, then it's very easy to view that as a denomination just like all the rest. And then worldliness in the church. Somebody said a long time ago, when the church is in the world, that's a great thing. But when the world gets into the church, it sinks. And what I mean by world is in church is you get your ideas from the world about your morals. You get your ideas about what's right and wrong from the world. And that's worldliness. The way we dress. It's fine to be like the world as long as we're not immodest. It's all right to go to a restaurant, but it's not okay to practice social drinking. But some church of Christ defend that today. 
And so what's happening is worldliness is getting into the church. And then the tendencies that I've pointed out towards compromise. Let's not say anything that will make anybody mad. I agree. Let's speak as the Bible speaks and remain silent as the Bible is silent. No, we can't do that. That'll make some people mad. Well, I remember in John 6, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the majority of the people who followed him for the loaves and the fishes left. And the disciples said, do you know that you've offended these people? He said, what if they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven? You see, you can't deny truth, even if the majority of the world rejects it. And when you see that happening toward the Lord's church, the church of Christ, the church in the Bible, then go back to Revelation 12. Remember, that great dragon has been doing a lot of dangerous work. And guess who's at threat? You and I are. This congregation's in danger. And so we have to be an outpost, a fort in a very hostile world, being led by Satan. John the Apostle of Love in 1 John 5 said, We know that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. John, you think you need a little grip the only one to go into heaven? Sounds like it, doesn't it? You know what I say to people when they ask me that? I say, no, what I believe is everybody who believes the Bible and obeys it is going to heaven and nobody else. It's not about me. I didn't invent this stuff. I'm just showing you the blueprint that came out of God's Word. And then the lack of personal consecration. When we start just barely studying God's Word and saying a little prayer here and there and not really being personally dedicated to putting Christ first in our lives and living that way every day, that's what I call a lack of personal consecration. And the sad thing is there's a lot of denominations out there full of members who are very good at personal consecration. They read their Bible every day. They study the Bible. They teach others. They go out in the neighborhood and try to practice benevolence. And they're just working nonstop. But their zeal is not according to knowledge. And so we should be personally consecrated with the knowledge that we have. What are some remedies? Well, our time's up, but I'm going to show you a few. Don't forget your separation. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. Come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Paul was saying that in reference to the church at Corinth and all the false things that were on in that community. Idol worship, different things of that sort. And he said, come out and be separate. And so we must do the same today. Be the same in speech. Speak as the oracles of God. In doctrine. Do you know that repeatedly in 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, there's the thing, remain faithful to sound doctrine, sound words. If there's not the truth, then what is a sound doctrine or sound word? Sound means according to scriptures. And so Acts 2.42, continuing the apostles' doctrine. And the work, worship, and organization we've already identified must maintain that as well. And then number two, Maintain our identity of spiritual warriors. Don't lay your armor down. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5 that Tim quotes often. It's a great passage. And verse 3 says, Though we live in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. But our denominational friends do. That's how they fight. With denominational tactics, carnal tactics. But he said, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, What strongholds? Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's what this lesson did today. If that lesson offends somebody, then they've got the problem, not me. I'm simply doing what the Lord told me to do. Bring every thought in captivity to the obedience of Christ. I want to do everything as a Christian and everything as a member of the Lord's church according to the Scriptures. That's how I bring every thought and obedience to the doctrine of Christ. Rejecting false teachers and taking a stand. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And thirdly, maintain our identity of sound preaching. What I have preached today will not be preached in about 75% of the church of Christ in America today. 
Isn't that sad? Amen. I know several of you remember the Persinos when they came over here. That's been a long time ago. I still keep up with them on Facebook. And Anthony just the other day had a bypass surgery, so keep him in your prayers. But they came over here from Leavenworth one Sunday morning, and I preached a lesson almost identical to this. It was about the distinctive nature of the church and went through all these points. And they met me at the back door back there. And Anthony, being Italian, stood right to my nose. And he said, do you know if you preach that in Leavenworth, they wouldn't let you in? I said, yeah, I knew that. He said, well, that's where we came from and that's why we left. <laughs> and we spent about an hour standing back there comparing notes. He was wanting to be sure that what we taught was according to the scriptures. And when he was satisfied, their family placed membership with us. Those of you who remember them. Remember how zealous they were for the truth. How great that was. Acts 20 and 26 and 7, Paul said, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare the whole counsel of God. Now if you think that me as a human being and as an individual would not want to be friends with all our denominational world, and to get along with them, to shake hands and say, well, at least we all believe in Jesus as the Son of God. And we're fighting that against the rest of the unbelieving world. I'd love to be able to do that. But I would be guilty of the blood of all men if I did that. Paul gave me a command as he did all young gospel preachers and old alike. Preach the word. Be, in, be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. The time's here for some churches. Is it here for you? Are you following the scriptures? Are you following the apostles' doctrine? Are you following the blueprint laid forth by Jesus Christ Himself? Because He said, I desire for men to worship me in spirit and in truth. We have to ask ourselves where did we get our faith? Because some brethren are getting their faith from their denominational friends because they've been listening to their harping about the church of Christ and how unique our identity is. Be sure you believe the scriptures, not the world. Some are fearful that sound preaching will drive away visitors. Well, let's just put the other side of this coin. Suppose we stop preaching sound preaching. What will that bring? That will bring in unsound visitors who will become unsound members. That means we'll be an unsound church and the building will be full. But we won't be the Lord's church. If you want to go out and start a human denomination, go, go have at it because that's what 300 different groups have done before. But that's not why I'm a Christian. That's not why I'm here. That's not why I'm a preacher of the gospel. Prove all things, Paul said, hold fast to that which is true. That's your job too. If you don't like what I preach, then you can go home and take every note. I'll give you my outline and you show me where I'm wrong. Because the scriptures are true and every other man will be a liar. We are to practice the fruit of the Spirit, but also condemn the works of the flesh. So that's the lesson for this morning. The Church of Christ is a divine organization built according to the divine pattern and that pattern must not be corrupted. And Paul warned when he was talking about building the church. He said, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy what? Him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you, that's plural in the Greek, which temple you are. That's the church. I know some brother quoted that and said, well, I thought that's the, our bodies. No, that's 1 Corinthians 6. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, and you are not your own. But 1 Corinthians 3, that temple is the Lord's church. And Paul says to those Corinthian brethren who are teaching man-made doctrines. You remember they're following after men? He said, if you defile the temple of God, God will destroy you because His temple is holy. Do you and I think that if we try to change the Lord's church that was bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, that God will hold us innocent? If so, you're not reading the same Bible that I'm reading. God will hold us guilty. He will destroy us because we've been doing the work of Satan in Revelation chapter 12. I know this is a difficult sermon, but I also know it's important because our souls are at stake. And again, if we're teaching error or we're being too, too strict or too narrow, then let's talk about it. If we're doing what's right, then 
be sure in your mind that what we've taught is the truth. Know it so well that when your denominational friends and loved ones begin to say, well, as long as we believe in Jesus, we can disagree on doctrine. Whip out that sword and say, you know what, that's not true. And here's the scripture to prove it. Because here's something you find out about teaching people. If you take an honest, sincere person and show them the truth, they'll either do one of two things. They'll obey it or they'll quit being honest. That's the only choice they have. If it's your loved ones and your friends and your families or my loved ones, my friends, my family, we all have members from denominations. We can't get to them because they're convinced they're right, but they're not following the pattern. What I'm trying to tell us today is be sure you know what the pattern is and be sure you're following it. Don't let Satan deceive you. Evil associations will corrupt good morals and will corrupt good convictions if you're not careful. Thank you for listening this morning. If you need to obey the gospel in faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, for the remission of sins, you'll become a child of God, a saint. You'll put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll put on the whole armor of God. You'll fight against the wiles of the devil. And we will have the victory that overcomes the world, our faith, the faith of the gospel. If you'd like to respond this morning, and this is your invitation while we stand and sing.